Our next speaker, um, Alex Jules, is a secular activist in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, commonly, um, commonly involved in issues and topics regarding the role of diversity in the atheist community, as well as atheism in diverse communities. He's the chair of the Dallas-Fort Worth Coalition of Reasons Diversity Council, organizer for black non-believers of Dallas, and is a founding member of the largest family-based secular humanist organization in Texas, the Fellowship of Free Thought. Please welcome to the stage, Alex Jules. I need you all to get like really close now. Okay. <laughs> what was really funny is <laughs> they gave me a t-shirt and they said, they said uh, meet, I wanted a medium. <laughs> it was like, does it come in a C cup? <laughs> like, no way. Uh, like a lot of speakers, I had to kind of change up my, um, my talk this week because stuff happened. I, I, <laughs> I, I was going to come here and, and try and discuss and try and convince a lot of people that racism exists. <laughs> and I was going to have this long conversation about race, the enduring power of racist tropes. Is racism real? Are we just being too sensitive? Didn't slavery end a long time ago? That's like, how do I, how do I make them believe? <laughs> well, damn. We're, we're going to get back to him in a minute. <laughs> um, because I think that if you're an atheist, a skeptic, someone who believes in equality, a humanist, an activist, I know you might feel really dejected and defeated right now. I do. Um, but I have a message for you later. Because I think there's a real opportunity in this mess. But before I get back to that, I, I did keep a few pieces of my talk that I, I, I want to cover with you. Um, and and it, is, it does start with racism. Race, racist, actually two words. And, and two words that are actually pretty related, but often evoke very different responses from people. The first one being racism. Hi, Greta. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. <laughs> Racism is a product of the complex interaction in a given society of race-based worldview with prejudice, stereotyping, and discrimination. Racism can be present in social actions, practices, or political systems, like apartheid. That makes sense, right? That's, that's what racism is. And then we get to the word racist. And that's, that's kind of easy, too. A, a person who believes that a particular race is superior to another, having or showing the belief that a particular race is superior to another. I mean, that's, I, I kind of get that. All right. But I didn't include here is the prejudice plus power, because we're not winning that fight. Not right now. That's a term that comes from the study of oppression, power dynamics, and sociology. It's like the term white privilege, or any privilege. Most people deny the existence unless they can see its effect. And it's got to be immediate. Those terms are amorphous. They change based on the dynamics of the situation. And it's often lost when activism meets delay. That particular definition, power plus privilege, addresses power dynamics, not the core definition that we're struggling with when we're trying to talk with allies or even not allies. And it's important because that's kind of where we're at now 
we've lost all nuance. Most people will accept the first, racism. Most people will deny the latter because I'm not racist. But that's because no one ever is. Philip Duray's investigations of lynchings in the South turned up no actual lynchers. And it actually got titled, Lynching at the Hands of Persons Unknown. Both David Duke and George Wallace both denied that they were racist. And that's the problem with the resiliency of the term. It's so ugly, so noxious and toxic that even racist don't want to be called racist. <laughs> the word is ugly. There are only a few equivalents. It means monster, an outcast, someone who leads the lynch mob and keeps Mein Kampf in his back pocket. <laughs> Which is exactly why we see that all the time. I'm not racist. Okay. They don't like it. They don't like it. In George W. Bush's memoir, Decision Points, he considered and you've got to take this with the gravity that it said. He considered being called a racist the most painful memory as a president. Not killing innocent people in Iraq. Being called a racist. Again, an aversion to the term racist, yet not denying that racism exists. At least it exists in a vacuum somewhere, just now where I stand. So let's look elsewhere. Okay. We see a lot of studies that talk about implicit versus explicit bias. And this one is actually a really popular one. A few years ago, UCLA researcher, Dr. Connor Holbrook, the Holbrook study, uh, published a paper in the Journal of Evolution and Human Behavior discussing the impact of names and bias. The participant sample, despite being slightly left of center politically, automatically attributed violence to individuals based solely on having names like Darnell, Juan, Aaliyah, whereas names such as Connor automatically led to expectations of prestige and status. This seems to clearly echo, he stated, fear of black and Latino men in our society, which is ironic and disturbing as they are often the victims of violence precisely because people are afraid of them. In a similar study, I'm gonna do this, why not? <laughs> you know y'all were thinking it. In a, yeah, and yes, yes you are. In a similar study with Harvard researchers, uh, found that white sounding names receive 50% more callbacks. About one in 10 resumes with a white sounding name received a callback compared to one in 15 with black sounding names. The racial bias response cut across all industries. It didn't matter what you were in. Food, hospitality, accounting. Even companies that advertise themselves as equal opportunity discriminated at the same rate. As now we've even seen with Facebook, with their advertising algorithms. Okay, so possibly. So we know that racism exists. We can test for it within the systems. We can quantify some of its effects, but then in the same breath, deny that we play a role in it because the system consists and is made up of people, biological organisms. Mm. Okay. So what we're talking about then is possibly escaping 
biology. Okay. I got my stuff out of order. There we go. <clears throat> the second you tell me that you can't possibly be racist while growing up in a country that perpetuates racism, I got to call BS. Because now we're talking about escaping your biology. It's something that we're not really capable of, not really. Studies have shown that most people have an initial racial bias observed in the amygdala. But other parts in the brain regulate the initial negative bias. These neurological insights show that there are ways racism can be reversed through exposure to other races and changing cultural beliefs, but are often reinforced through negative exposures. And that kind of sort of makes sense when we start looking at what happens with police because that's the first trigger in a fear response. Do I pull the trigger? Yes. Is it because I'm racist? Well, maybe. In a 2000 study led by Liz Phelps, a cognitive neuroscientist at New York University, suggested that the amygdala, a brain region involved in fear processing, and the fast automatic thinking system drives racial bias. And among other functions, the amygdala guides behavior by forming associations between experiences and unpleasant reactions. It also generates the emotional reaction to words, sights or ideas you find unpleasant, which is why when someone says the term or the word vomit, sometimes you actually feel like you want to vomit. To see if the amygdala, now this is actually cool, to see if the amygdala was involved in racial bias, she devised a simple test. She showed 12 white undergraduates pictures of faces of black and white male strangers while they were in an MRI. She also measured racial bias using a test designed to root out implicit, unspoken opinions that someone may suppress for fear of appearance, right? Because you don't want to appear like you're racist or biased. In the test, subjects categorize words as either good, joy, love, peace, or bad, cancer, death, war, exes. At the same time that they categorized these faces they saw in the MRI machine as black or white. In half of the trials, they used the same response for good, and uh, they used the same response for good and, and white. So left button for good, white, right, right for bad, black. In the other half, the pairing switched up a little bit, et cetera. So what they found was that participants with strong racial bias also had the most activation in their amygdala when viewing black faces compared to viewing white faces. The same people who were slowest at responding when black was paired with good had the greatest amygdala activation when viewing black faces. Their slower response time suggests that they have to override the automatic system response of the amygdala. They have to stop and think about it. Can you imagine trying to do that when you're in a response, a fear response situation and you have a gun? So less amygdala reaction means fewer competing thoughts to prevent someone from pressing the left button, etc. So these results suggest that of the two systems of thinking, fast automatic processing is more involved in racial bias. They also explain why bias stubbornly persists, even if our cultural mores tell us it's wrong. Negative thoughts crop up automatically before we're consciously aware of them. So tamping them down requires extra mental effort. Now, there is an alternative. It's kind of hard. Um, who's going to stop tweeting? Thank you. <laughs> it's 
In the study, they introduced propanol, prop uh, is actually propanolol, to affect subconscious bias. So we're talking about getting high. <laughs> and what they found was the males who took it showed significantly less subconscious bias. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on the test, the group that took the placebo took over a second longer to press the, the button for black, gold, black good compared to white good. The group that took prop propanolol uh, took a, just a quarter of a second longer to press the button for uh, black good on average, an improvement of three quarters of a second. That's, that's pretty significant. Now, it's interesting because that's the same drug that we often use with people who deal with PTSD. So we as humans are capable of this bias. And we have to overcome that and other biases by constant exposure, stopping, or, or drugs. <laughs> yeah. And you have to do that while living in a country that continues to reinforce those biases. Because America has a really long, long history of racism. These lands were conquered and founded on some form of racism. Native Americans were forced to serve Columbus by several various forms of cruelty, as far <laughs> Oh, now they're just screwing with me. <laughs> uh, okay, so as, as far back as 1492, Native Americans were ripped apart. I, I didn't realize that how vicious it had gotten. Native Americans were ripped apart by vicious attack dogs, butchered to provide food for their dogs. Native Americans were forced to mine gold and had quotas, and if you didn't make quota, you had your hand and your feet cut off, and you bled to death. The mass extermination of Native Americans under Columbus rule was one of the most horrifying instances of genocide in human history. Here's an interesting fact. Since Catholics weren't supposed to be slaves to other Catholics, Native Americans were never baptized as part of conversion. And then, of course, Africans were brought to the U.S. in chains in 1619. Japanese Americans in 1492, executive order signed by President Roosevelt authorized the internment of Japanese Americans, and we, of course, it, it continues. Legal segregation ended technically in 1954. However, if you take a look at that in 2016, 2016, this year, Mississippi finally desegregated one of its districts. In 2016, it took a federal judge issuing an order to desegregate a school in 2016. Of course, we continue to deal with many forms of racism in the systems. All you have to do is read a DOJ report. Cleveland, Baltimore, Ferguson, LA. LA, of course, lost oversight of its police department for several years because of prejudicial and overtly racist predatory practices. They just got it back a couple of years ago and they started turning off their body cams, their dash cams. And of course, we haven't addressed the implicit inequalities that resulted from unequal justice and mass incarceration or the resistance to rename sports teams. Mm. 
most people will tell you that the idea of race is a social construction. It's not real, especially in the secular community. So get over it. Marx, 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 class systems, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to reference Sam Harris. Oops. Um, <laughs> if you want to have a real conversation about race, you don't bring on an economist. And I hear this in the secular community. Yeah, you can quote me on that. Uh, and I hear this in the secular community pretty often when discussing racism. I do, except the world, the world, because everyone wants to be colorblind, but the world is it. The world talks about race and simply dismissing it doesn't make it go away. Just like not talking about dying doesn't mean that you won't die. And here's a little history. What if I told you that the idea of race was a Christian construct and racism a way to keep Christianity pure? And what if it just got a little out of hand The concept of human races began during the Spanish Inquisition around 1480. You can go back a little bit, but that's generally when historians say, yeah, about 1480. When a purity of blood decree was established and those converting to Christianity needed to prove their Christian origins. Racism became even more established a little bit later during colonization when two theories were developed to explain why people in other parts of the world looked and behaved differently from Europeans. They were just other, <laughs> other Europeans and other. Others were those who were created by God but had degenerated. We actually see this in the Mormon theology, in particular with the Mark of Cain. In fact, white Protestantism was used from Jamestown, from the time of Jamestown, and well into the South as a way of managing the slave, othering the African, and justifying his place in treatment well into segregation, which itself was justified in the Bible between ethnic Israelites and foreigners. Though the more modern idea of specific races, as they are thought of today, developed through a long process that began with Western philosophers, kind of, like Hume and Kant, et cetera, we can't ignore the cultures that influenced them. Even the founding fathers, who identified primarily as deist, shared views that aligned with Christian theologies though we might, may not like it, American society he is heavily informed by this religious foundation, specifically in terms of racial injustice, even as religious identification declines. And though much of this we see a common thread in forms of echoes of Christianity from the Christian work ethic, which was measured in wealth, which got you closer to God, it's evolved into just work ethic and denying that those that don't have it, virtue, the lazy black. And this trope is continuously repeated in media and society. So pop quiz, real quick. Which one's the lone wolf and which one's the unpatriotic thug? And then we have passively just not knowing, which is where we see the majority of it. This was a really hot topic, and I know we have a couple of people who have talked about this in the audience. This was a really hot topic a few months ago where 
someone ignorant of some of the potholes kind of wrecked. This was, a very, this was very divisive because it highlighted what many of us just didn't know. It's not an excuse, but if we are consciously determining our boundaries in society, which is what we are always doing, then it's important that we acknowledge them. And here we wound up litigating intent instead of discussing the act. She didn't mean to be racist, so she wasn't racist. It's a defense mechanism, it's immunity to change. In addition, the majority of American parents just don't talk about race. It's too uncomfortable. We don't like it. An MTV survey showed that only 30% of millennials grew up even talking about race. And a 2014 study by Bertoli and all showed that white parents only talk to their children about not being racist and described racism as a bad thing, telling their children not to even use the word black. That's it. And somehow, you were prepared to deal with racism. Don't use the word black. Don't notice the difference. But it never addresses the roots, the cause, the history, and ongoing problems with systemic racism. Nor do they understand the racial dynamics within society. So, if you're not talking about it, how are you going to escape it? So chances are, this is a very controversial number, chances are if you grew up in the U.S., you're at least a little racist. 51% of Americans now express explicit anti-black attitudes, compared with 48% in a similar survey in 2008, this is the AP poll, 2012, that looks at both implicit and explicit bias. They do it every four years. When measured by an implicit racial attitudes test, the number of Americans with anti-black sentiment jumped to 56%. Okay. What about the youth? supposed to get better. It does. When it comes to explicit prejudice against blacks, non-Hispanic white millennials, we're looking at about a 1 to 3 percent difference with the attitudes with baby boomers and Gen Xers. On work ethic, 31% of millennials rate blacks as lazier than whites, compared to 32% of Generation X whites and 35% of baby boomers. So it's not really getting better. What we're seeing is we're creating more racist, and they're not dying off. And it's changed. It's evolved. So President Obama actually said this um, a few years ago. Racism has changed. It, racism, we're not cured of it. And it's not just a matter of it not being polite to say nigger in public. That's not the measure of whether racism still exists or not. It's not just a matter of overt discrimination. Societies don't overnight completely erase everything that happened 200 to 300 years prior. 
racism has become casual. It involves negative stereotypes now, or prejudices about people on the basis of race, color, and ethnicity still, in the form of jokes, offhanded comments, and exclusion of people from social situations on the basis of race. It's hidden in conversation, or as we learned during this election cycle, it can be just as overt and accepted. And it might even get you elected. It's a little different than what we typically see. I've got a little bit of a video. Now this one got a lot of, uh, got a lot of clicks. It's not from the US. I'm just going to play it for you, and then I'll talk through it. Now, this was in Asia, and uh, that wasn't even subtle. <laughs> um, and, and, and I w wasn't even sure I was going to uh, talk about it, except that it made its round in the US. And what we got told is, you know, because we didn't like it, that we were being very sensitive. Um, which is kind of relevant <laughs> to the conversations that we're having about what is and what isn't political correctness. More on casual racism. What is it? It's the passing snipes. You're really pretty for a black girl. You sound so educated for a, insert. Wow, you don't sound black. Undercutting or dismissing the achievements based on race. Way to go for a action. That's how I got my education, right? That's how I got my promotion. We know why they're here. Of course you can't dunk. Of course you can dunk, you're black. And it's often coded in dismissive language or humor, making it really difficult to address. Can't take a joke. Stop being so sensitive. It's pretty virulent. It's been around for a couple of years in really popular media. We see it with Amy Schumer and most recently. But you, you see it here. And I could spend, I could have used pages and pages based on what's going on right now. Going back to Africa. Hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Yeah. And of course, the question that we often ask ourselves is, what about secularism? Well, right there is T.J. Kirk, the amazing atheist who... <laughs> I couldn't hear you. Could you speak up, please? <laughs> who actually is one of the loudest pundits in uh, the secular sphere. I don't want to say the movement because he's not part of the movement, but he is part of the secular sphere, uh, who is actually a Trump supporter, um, denies racism and several other things. Uh, but yeah, 
That's what we've got. Shouldn't I be able to say whatever I want whenever I want to, regardless of the impact? It doesn't matter whether it's true or not because it's my God-given American right, whether you believe in God or not, like him. Doesn't that really sound familiar? And then, of course, the term social justice war became the pejorative of choice for anyone who gave a damn. And the anti-PC camp crowned its new king. Okay. So, I promised a couple of people. I said, you know what? I'm not going to end on a bad note for you. So this can't be my last slide. <laughs> Although I almost want to walk off. <laughs> there you go. America, you asked. Um, we've been given a chance, a do-over. For the last few years, Movement atheism in particular hasn't seen massive increases in participation. It's felt a little distant or disconnected, drifty. We found ourselves disagreeing with each other on many things, diversity being one of them. I argued the benefit of that being, we're that big, we're really that big. And now, we've gotten to the point where we can afford to do this. We can splinter because our relevance was being challenged. Because atheism, atheism was moving more mainstream. However, decency, equality, rights, and the protection of minorities and social nets weren't the only things that were challenged in this election. So was secularism. There were a lot of reasons, he who shall not be named, one. But one of the biggest ones was the religious right showed up to say no more to progress to take back the reins of godlessness, law and order. Where do you think they derive their understanding of authority from? No more progress for the LGBTQ community. Or if you're black, brown, Muslim, you are now being challenged by white, Protestant evangelicals whose cultural impact we not only see in transgender issues, but the arcane practices of race delineation that still impact how you see me. If our community can recenter itself and understand that secularism, separation of church and state, various forms of equality are also social justice issues. Then maybe this movement can regain the power of allyship. That's my only real silver lining, because although many of you get to be angry, many of us get to be scared. I grew up learning that black was beautiful, because at first it wasn't. I'm not ashamed of my skin or my children's, but as I got 
the first stories of hijabs being pulled, racial slurs being used so freely, bullying on the streets. For the first time since her birth, I looked at my youngest daughter's blue eyes and pale skin and wondered whether it was enough for her to pass. That's my new old reality. I get to do this as I fear for my small, diverse community of Middle Easterners, Hispanics, etc., now surrounded by angry Texas Trump supporters. This is your chance to be relevant again, to stand up against this message. Seize it. Thank you.